Welcome to the Ricky Matthews Show from the Citizen Bank Studio. Hope you're having a great day as we continue to celebrate all the amazing people across the state of Mississippi who are working really hard to make this such a great place to live, work, and play. Hey, listen, we have a great show today. We're going to talk about, kind of circle back with a, a previous guest and have a conversation about uh, childhood obes obe obesity. And uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. But I wanted to share something with you. So, some of this is, uh, is prompted by the attempted assassination of uh, President Trump. Some of this is uh, sort of guided. Some of what I'm going to share is just guided by conversations I've been having with friends of mine. And then, of course, I came across a really interesting, important quote that, that caused me to do some digging about this person that gave, that offered this quote. And I just thought it kind of fit to the moment as I was thinking about this. But it goes back to, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine. I've reconnected with so many people because of this show. It's been great because when I retired in 2016, I, I went deep undercover. I had my close, close, close friends, and but then mostly I just you know, was uh, focused on my place up in the Mississippi Delta and my grandkids here. And, and that's that's kind of what I thought my life was going to be until I got that phone call that started a conversation that led to this show. I forgot how much I enjoyed connecting with the community and with, with old friends, especially friends I worked with in the community, uh, especially after Hurricane Katrina. But So I've had a lot of really interesting conversations, but I was having this conversation with a friend of mine. It's kind of an ongoing conversation. It was We were having it before... Uh, the, the the Trump uh, shooting, and then we've had it since. And it kind of goes like this. He, he said, you know, when I do f from time to time talk about the national situation, people enjoy hearing what, what my point of view about that is. We'll get there when I'm having conversations with Jim Asher, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning editor, used to lead the Washington Bureau, came down to work with us after Hurricane Katrina for the Sun-Herald. Jim and I will go there and have conversations about sort of the national condition or Ashley Edwards and I. And there are a couple of other guests that may, may elicit some of my thinking about the situation. But usually the, the focus is on the guest. The focus is on the, either a specific topic or a leader in understanding what makes them tick. I, I don't want the focus to be on what I think. I, I want the focus to be on what they think. So I was, um, I was, you know, I said, you know, why would it matter? Why does it matter what I think? I, I said to my friend, and he said that it matters what you think because you have a following. People listen to your show. They pay attention, and they listen to your conversations with leaders, and um, they learn a lot about uh, what's happening in coastal Mississippi. And when you do venture off into these other topics, especially as it relates to media and the role of the First Amendment in society to keep democracy viable, people care about those conversations. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people talking about the national situation. So, you know, what can I personally offer to it that would, uh, that would, add, that would add anything at the end of the day? I, I, I think it's important always, though, if I'm going to say anything that I bring a perspective that as a former publisher and someone believes so strongly in the role the First Amendment plays, you know, to educate people about that experience and to apply that experience to the current situation and maybe, maybe help people, you know, kind of open their minds a little bit and, and think more rigorously about the challenges we have in this country. And I do think the challenges we have in this country center around a role that media has to play. It could be social media. It could be corporate media. <laughs> it could be the role that newspapers and uh, digital media websites, they, I mean, we all share in this thing together. It could be the role that radio plays in this. But I came across, I, I remember reading about a person by the name of Ida Wells Barnett, uh, long, long ago, um, a journalist. She's an African American. She was an African American journalist. She was an educator. She's a Pulitzer Prize winning winner. I'll come back to that in a second. That was issued posthumously for her. But she was a civil rights activist. And she was born in Holly Springs, Mississippi, back in 1862. And what she's best known for is pioneering sort of her work around uh, documenting and exposing widespread African-American lynching in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And what you know, she, she was already focused on it, but then a friend of hers, his name was Thomas Moss, 
uh, was lynched back in 1892, and she then investigated and published what they call back in those days a pamphlet that revealed the true motives behind the lynching, which often stemmed from uh, economic competitive situation or maybe false accusations of rape. Um, but it was a it was a difficult time. But she believed so strongly that bringing clarity to those situations and writing about them and telling the truth was so important. She was a fearless advocate, and she demonstrated what you want uh, journalism to be. You want journalism to be in a situation where it speaks truth to power. And the, the Pulitzer that she was awarded, again, she, she died in 1931, but she was awarded a Pulitzer posthumously. It was a special citation back in 2020, that recently. And it stated that she, you know, it was for her outstanding and courageous reporting of the horrors of lynching in America. And here's one of the things she said along the way. She said, the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. To turn the light of truth on wrongs. And, it, you know, the truth is, are we doing enough of that? I, Ida Wells Barnett was so true in, in her advocacy and her writing about it and the way she brought so much incredible and powerful attention to the lynching issue. And, you know, you go back in time, there's so many incredible journalists who have done exactly the same thing over time. And, you know, there's never been a more important time than now. There's never been a more important time than now to have journalism that you can trust. So as my wife Ann and I watched, uh, we were watching live as Trump went to speak at this rally, and of course the the guns go off, she couldn't really she, she it, it, literally she couldn't understand in reality what was happening, and I knew immediately what was happening, and, she, and I'm having to explain to her they just shot Trump, that those are bullets, and and that's just, that's the Secret Service all over him, you know all of us wondered did he get hit, we saw the blood. But was there another bullet somewhere else? We didn't really understand what we were seeing. But everything around that incident has been alarming. And when you consider the efforts of the federal government surrounding D Donald Trump, and this is not a political statement. And I think some of, those, some of those efforts are warranted and some of those efforts are not. But what we have now in America is a situation where no one trusts our government and too many people don't trust media. And the very media that we that we should we should be leaning toward to help us, as as uh, Ida uh, Wells Barnett said, um, they should we they should be the ones that are that are that are shining the light on the wrongs and helping us understand the light of truth. Um, we don't know what to believe. You know, we don't know what to believe. All these conspiracy theories are already flying all over the place about. Did the did somebody somewhere know there was a weakness in the security, you know, apparatus that they maybe hoped some crazy person would feel? And has that happened before? And it just didn't get filled. And this is a way for an assassination to occur where their fingerprints wouldn't be on it. I'm not saying that's even possible or pliable. I'm saying these are the kind of things people are saying. They wonder about this. They don't trust our government. Um you know, there's too many media and media that are that are biased in their reporting, and so they're they're complicit actually in creating an environment of hatred where people feel like they could fill the void and attempt an assassination like we saw this past weekend. Um, I'm you know I'm I, I worry about I'm sad about it I'm distressed about it I, I believe our democracy is strong. Some say you know this put this creates a tenuous moment. I don't necessarily believe that. Um, I worry. Uh, I do worry about where all this is headed, and I do worry. You know who? What? What media can we lean on to sort of shine the light of truth on the situation in a way that we can trust what's coming out of this? Because we have to be able to speak truth to power. We have to have, be able to trust um, our our. Um, our media and the, and the media that's being covered. You know, just, you know, this week, Morning Joe was canceled. Morning Joe was canceled by NBC on that day because they were concerned about the toxicity that they might des describe. 
So they canceled it. I mean, is that does that sound like confidence in your team to do the right thing? Man, I'm wor- I'm worried about it. Another another uh, another quote I came across as I was contemplating all this was actually a quote from Lady Bird jo- uh, Johnson. She said, "The environment is where we all meet. Not, you know, the world. You know, and the the environment is where we all meet, where we all have mutual interest. It is not only a mirror on ourselves." but a focusing lens on what we become. What will we become? What do we see when we look in the mirror? What responsibilities do we have to, uh, to kind of move things forward so that it's okay to disagree? As Billy, Billy Hughes said on my show a week or two ago, he said that when someone disagrees on the internet and social media, they think that that is you know, basically a ticket to warfare. And that's the, that's the, do what, buddy? Okay, thank you very much. That's that's kind of letting me know that we're getting to the end of this. But I share two other quotes at the at, when we come back on the other side, and then we'll uh, we'll move to our guest today. We'll see you after this break. Welcome back to the Ricky Matthews Show from the Citizens Bank Studio. Sorry for the heavy message today, but you know I, I'm a, as a former publisher, as someone who cares deeply about the role media should play in society. I know that media is complicit, completely complicit in this situation. And in some ways, I think we all ought to look in the mirror, as I was saying. I mean, this this quote from Lady Bird Johnson is only a mirror of ourselves, but our, but it's not only a mirror of ourselves, but a focusing lens, uh, lens on what we, we become. And so, you know, what do we see when we look in the mirror? Are we, are we complicit in our language and the way we talk about these things? Um, Another one that I ran across is Malala said this, there is no greater weapon than knowledge and no greater source of knowledge than the written word. And having a written word that that is, is, is a written word that we can trust, at least from a journalism, journalism and First Amendment perspective, gosh, is that important. And then lastly, Sir Patrick Stewart said this, it is what you do from now on that will either move our civilization forward a few tiny steps or else begin to march us steadily backwards. What's our role in helping to steadily march us forward? That's, that's, uh, that's, the, that's the question I will continue to have. In some ways, maybe the Trump situation as it relates to this assassination attempt, maybe it's going to bring our country together in some ways. I mean, we were a millimeter away from a disaster. And the way I would say it is a level of horror that we don't even know what it would have been, but it wouldn't have been good. I can tell you that um, it's it, it's <laughs> the outcome would not have been good. And I'm glad that we're not in a situation where we're contemplating that reality today. That is for sure. Um, in final analysis, man, there's just a powerful role that journalism plays in all of this. Too many are stoking the fires and not enough are thinking, as Ida Wells Barnett thought, the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. And we got to work harder to find the truth. That is for sure. So now let's shift gears. Listen, um, we had a show uh, a few weeks ago with uh, with Kelsey uh, Kiel. From the, she's the executive director of Let's Go Gulf Coast. It's a fund that the Gulf Coast Community Foundation put together. She was a top 10 under 40 One Coast Award winner. And uh, I enjoyed the conversation and I enjoyed hearing her story. But I thought, gosh, we got to circle back and come back and talk about childhood obesity and all the work that she's doing. And so I invited her back. And so I'm thrilled to, to have Kelsey back on the show to, to get today. Kelsey, how are you doing? I'm doing well, and thank you so much for having me back. I'm so happy to be here. It was great talking to you last time. Well, listen, uh, you've you've uh, you got a great education. We talked about your story. You actually have a PhD, and you worked hard to to get educated the way you are, and you've wor- really worked hard in this particular position. You heard what I was saying just now about the role that media plays, the re- the responsibility we all have to look in the mirror and say, what role am I going to play to advance? America forward? Am I going to play a role in, in helping keep the, the division the way that it is? You know, you know, when you talk to your friends, what, what do y'all talk about? 
Oh, geez. Um, I guess we talk about all sorts of things. I mean, kind of touching on what you were saying, like the importance of journalism and media. And it is unfortunate to see how sometimes things can be so biased and lean one way or the other, Um, especially coming from just like my educational background, you know, with public health and having a background in like biostatistics. You know, I'm very data driven, but then even in the world of research, you can see news articles and different things getting published and data being skewed to, you know, promote one thing or another um, and kind of manipulating it. I mean, you hear about these things all the time. I feel like, you know, big data and how it can be dangerous and manipulated. And I do think that is true. Um, And there's a need just to really present the facts, especially, you know, more in my realm, just with public health and trying to get people healthy. There's still even all these misconceptions and data that's being misrepresented and, you know, myths and facts. It's hard to kind of pull these things apart. So for me, I think that kind of ties back similar to what you were saying about journalism and reporting. You know, there can be all these gray areas when all I'm trying to look for is just getting the facts, you know, present this to our community. I like some of the quotes you were saying, you know, I think it's important for me and what I'm driven by too is I want to do what I can to leave the world a better place, even if it's just our little community and here on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, try to have that positive impact um, with as few or as many people as possible. I think that's important and I think people need to try to remember that and like what they can do and nothing is too small. You know, you could have one small encounter with a person and that could change their whole outlook for the day, the week, a month, you know, you don't really know how long, but yeah, being data driven and truthful, especially when it comes to the media and even in science and research and how that is all being reported across the nation and along a whole skew of things, it's challenging you know, and it's frustrating. I feel like from your perspective and my perspective, you know, to see some of those biases, because that's not what it's supposed to be like. Yeah, you know, the the pandemic made it worse. I mean, but here's the interesting thing is that we, newspapers for so long were, you know, were these layers of editors and this work to make the report objective and, you know, hiring professional journalists and really working hard to, to, to share the facts so that, so that people, that's the way democracy works. You give them the facts, so they then they can decide how they believe they what they want to believe and and yeah. and what their opinion will be about that. And we worked hard to put the opinion on the editorial pages. But you know, this really kind of dates back to Ted Turner when he started CNN and the evolution of cable news and having to fill the time, and they filled it with talking heads and. They began to lean politically, and more of these cable news networks came along. And so this was actually uh, uh, already very much moving in that in the direction of not really understanding or not really being able to d- discern what you can trust and what you can't trust before social media came along. But as the AI, the artificial intelligence, and the data, as you pointed out, began to collect our data and understand our opinions based on what we posted – as they began to gather all this information, what they ended up doing, instead of creating a, an environment where we can have civil disagreements about things, what they tended to do is only deliver our tribes to us and do it in such a polarizing way. Because, see, the social media companies make money when we're disagreeing, and they want there to be disagreeing, disagreeing engagement. And that's the way the algorithm is set up. So you've got a situation that was already going down that road with cable news, and then it gets exacerbated by social media. And then, you know, in that environment, bias and misinformation and and pure propaganda can really perpetuate. And that's why I say during the pandemic, we were all told to think one thing. And, you know, and then other other sciences tried to say, maybe there's an alternate view about this. But they said, no, you can't think that way. If you think that way, you're a radical. They, they said, you know, we we're moving too fast on, 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 um, on moving toward, you know, getting the shots. And, you know, it's what about that technology? I personally had a very severe cardiac reaction to, to the vaccination. Um, it didn't almost kill me. And my heart literally stopped for seven minutes. I mean, seven seven seconds. Gosh. Excuse me, not seven minutes. But well, I'm sorry to hear that. I yeah, I mean, it, but see, the point is though, we 
all of this swirls around us and people Mm -hmm. as a general rule don't know what to trust and people don't do their own homework. So as one of my guests said one day, I think it was actually Mark Henderson. He's such a smart entrepreneurial technology guy, but he said people wake up every morning waiting for to be told what to think today on Facebook and they don't do their own thinking. And, you know, when we live in a place like that, it's a, it's troubling. So, you know, you put that on top of the events and you see that there are so many people who have a role in creating an environment where such, such a thing like that can happen. And how do we, how do we tamp it down? How do we, how do we not hate each other if we disagree with each other? I want to try to live by example doing the show. I want to try to p- present a situation where we can disagree without without being personal about it. Um, yeah. You know, we can definitely disagree, but that unfortunately people don't as a general rule too many don't think of it that way. And it's a it's a tough world we live in. But yeah, that's enough about that. Um, but I, I do appreciate your point of view. I, I can see from a science point of view, really honestly, that it's troubling for for anyone that does what you guys do because you, you, there are there are facts, and then there are things that are not facts that people present as facts, and it makes it harder to make your points made. And I, I get that. So, look, let's shift gears. Let's remind people what your organization is all about. Okay, we can do that for sure. Um, so I'm the executive director of Let's Go Gulf Coast. We are a local nonprofit on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, and we're a fund of the Gulf Coast Community Foundation, and they are just absolutely wonderful to kind of work underneath of. So our goal is to obviously try to combat childhood obesity. We have numerous programs and um, initiatives that we do out in the communities. So everything that we do is around one simple healthy message, and that's the 5210 message. And I'm not sure if you've seen that or heard of that before. Um, It actually started in the state of Maine probably almost 30 years ago now, and they did a lot of evidence-based research on kind of this community prevention program. So kind of taking things a step back from individual health care. We'll, we'll pick it up from right there with Kelsey as we continue the discussion about childhood obesity when we get on the other side. We'll see you after this break. Well, listen, uh, childhood obesity is a huge issue. And as a general rule, too many people don't understand what living a healthy lifestyle is all about. And then you add to that electronic devices and kids not going out and being in, involved in physical activities and so on. There's a, there's a lot of work to be done, and uh, uh, Kelsey Kill is the executive director of Let's Go Gulf Coast. It's a fund of the Gulf Coast Community Foundation, and they aim to combat childhood obesity here in coastal Mississippi. And when we went to break, we were just talking a little bit about what this program is, and we'll get into some of the specifics uh, in, in here in just a second. But what else do you want to add to that that you were that you were into before we went to break? Yeah, just I was kind of starting to explain a little bit of the modeling and the theoretical basis for our programming. So everything we do is around this one simple healthy message, 5210. And so the research behind that is if you have one simple healthy message, then people are more likely to learn it and then slowly over time start to adapt it. So the five is trying to get everyone, children and adults, to consume five or more servings of fruits and vegetables every day. So simple enough, it seems. Um, The two then goes into two hours or less of recreational screen time, which is important, as you were just mentioning, all the electronic devices that are available now. And then one is one hour or more of physical activity every day. And the zero stands for zero sugary drinks. So trying to get children and adults to consume more water or low fat milk for children. So it's simple, it's kind of catchy, you know, let's go, let's go 5210. We can use it in a myriad of different right ways. We have posters, we have so many materials with that around. So the hope is if you have this one message and it's plastered all over the community, then slowly over time, you can get people to really see it, think about it and start to adapt it and make some changes. Yeah, Cassie, I talk about this all the time and uh, Robbie D'Angelo, who is a human optimization coach, he spends a lot of time about getting your mind and your body in tune with one another. But we talk about this regularly. And I've shared my story many times. For over 40 years, I've tried to live a healthy lifestyle. But, you know, you think about 
um, you know, walking and how important that is and water and drinking plenty of water. I don't drink any sugar drinks. I talked to a friend of mine just the other day. He said that he, he, he stopped alcohol completely. He hasn't drank, drink a, a glass of wine or anything. He's not, I would say probably his, he would lean toward wine drinking. That was his main thing. And he says that I had any wine in six months, excuse me, six weeks. And he's, he said that he has not had any sugar at all in his diet. He took all sugar out of his diet. So no sugar drinks, nothing, no, wow. no desserts, in, in any of that stuff. And in, a, in six weeks, he's lost you know, somewhere between 20 and 30 pounds just, just doing the basic stuff. Just to, I mean, he's not going into a big weight room and pumping iron for you know two hours a day. Or any, I mean, he just he just said, "I'm gonna walk more. I'm gonna drink more water. I'm gonna stop drinking alcohol, and I'm gonna take sugar out of my diet." And just by making those changes, he's lost between twenty and thirty pounds. How did America get into a situation where there's like, we're surrounded by processed food and marketing and sugar drinks? How did sugar water become so much? a part of who we are at a time when we know what the negative impact is going to be. I know. That's great. I mean, congratulations to your friend. I think that's so important to hear that real life story from you. I mean, I have dozens of those stories from working out in the community over the years. But yeah, something about in America, and there's other people who are more educated on this than me, but there's a lot of research into now how everything is almost monetized. You know, something so simple as we need more exercise, where maybe in Europe they walk more. You know, they're riding bikes more. That's their mode trans their main mode of transportation. In cities, we're here, you know, we have cars. In some places there's trains and more, you know, metropolis areas. But now everything is almost kind of monetized. So getting people to exercise, you know, one thing I can touch on quick for an hour a day. That should be something so basic, but kind of touching on what you were saying before and coming full circle, you know, the media is so powerful in marketing and what people think they should be doing. They think in order to exercise for that one hour a day, you know, they need to spend money. They need to join the gym. They need to go to yoga. They have to go to spin. They have to do all of these things when it really doesn't have to be that complicated and it doesn't have to cost you anything. You know, little things that we try to work with on people is just educating them on how you can make very small changes, but they can have a big impact. You know, little things, if you work in an office building or if you're going to an appointment, you know, instead of taking the elevator, try to walk two, three, or four flights of stairs up and down. I mean, that's only going to take you a couple extra minutes. When you go to the grocery store, park in the back, you know, and take that walk. You know, sometimes it can be hard. It is 100 degrees out right now. But if you're only doing that, that's just a couple minutes into the store and out of the store. But if you do those things all throughout the day just to try to get your steps up, you know, at the end of the day, you've got 30 minutes, you know, to start with and eventually up to an hour of exercise. You don't have to be in the gym, dripping sweat, you know, hard cardio for an hour because that's not attainable for everyone. And then mostly it's not sustainable. You know, people do the crash diets and the crash exercise. You can only do that for so long. So that's a big thing that we promote are those small sustainable changes that people can keep up with. Hey, listen, I, I looked at my watch. Um, I, I went out this morning. I knew it was going to be a really hot day. Man, it was, you could cut the air when, you walk, when I walked out this morning, even early this morning. Um, but I, I've already walked 4.9 miles before I started the show awesome. today. But this is normal. Anne's used to me just saying that. But here's the point I want to make. For people who are in the habit of living a healthy lifestyle, the, I was just, let's apply this question specifically to parents who live a healthy lifestyle, who understand what that's all about, you probably have a far better chance to to have a, a child that's going to get this. Uh, so your efforts around children are really focused on their caregivers and people who are around them and how to change sort of the family's habits. That's That's a big part of what you do, isn't it? Yes, that is correct. And honestly, that's so insightful that you see that because a lot of people that message can almost get lost. So to try to bring this full circle, I was talking about how we use the 5210 message to try to infiltrate the community. So a lot of what our program does, you know, it's a community prevention program. So we don't necessarily provide, you know, one on one health care to an individual, you know, for people that come to us that are obese, we can try to re recommend you to providers or other people like a specific dietitian, 
but more from the community level is what we're interested in. So we do work a lot directly with children. So we partner with schools, after school programs, and early child care centers. So working with kids through like the Boys and Girls Club, through Head Starts, through various school districts, elementary, middle, high school, we have different programs and education that we do with them. It's all hands-on learning and things like that. So that's a huge part of what we do. But then just as equally important is working with adults. So the parents, the grandparents, the aunts, the uncles, your caregivers, your teachers, you know, we can teach kids, but kids aren't the ones that are making all of those powerful decisions back at home. You know, they're not necessarily grocery shopping or requesting the food that's able to be bought in the home. You know, they can only speak up so much for physical activity. So really getting everyone around children to try to change some of those social norms and their behaviors and their attitudes is can is how we can try to combat childhood obesity from like a social level. Um, and then specifically, kind of really to drive home, I have some quotes because I know you love quotes too, but a fun thing to know that is really jarring to me is there's endless research that's been done and it has shown that the behaviors that children have developed by the age of five are the behaviors that they'll carry with them throughout their lifetime. And for me, I have two young children, a now six-year-old and a four-year-old, and they're still like they're babies. They're so little. But to think that those behaviors that they've been taught are already ingrained in them, that's really important and powerful. You know, a lot of times, and we talk about this in the state of Mississippi too, you know, early childhood, some people think, you know, it's so important, but then other people don't necessarily get why it is so important. We work a lot with Excel by five as well, but getting those young kids in those healthy habits. Um, so some kind of quick examples for like what that means, you know, it's hard to conceptualize. I feel like sometimes for parents or grandparents, you know, like how can kids before they're five have those beha behaviors ingrained in them? So a really quick and easy one I think you can kind of understand is if you have young kids that are like, you know, two, three, four, and they're at home with you, your parents, grandparents, caregivers, whoever, and you're constantly rewarding them with sweets. You know, they did something good, like, okay, here's a lollipop. Do you want a cookie? Do you want this? It almost seems harmless and not that big a deal because obviously we want to give our kids sweets. And who doesn't want sweets? Um, but if that's all kids know and that's all they learn, then they'll kind of carry that with them throughout life. So if you fast forward to college and you start thinking about like the freshman 15, as they call it, well, if a young child has been rewarded with food from their early stages in life, that's how they will learn. That's how they'll know to reward themselves in college and into adulthood. So they'll be in college and, you know, like, oh, I did good on a test or in high school. And, okay, well, I'm going to reward myself. I'm going to have ice cream or sweets or cakes because that's what they know. You know, whereas if you can teach young kids, it's important, you know, to go out and like, let's go for a walk every night after dinner. Well, that's something that they'll just continue to do throughout their life. Hey, when we come back on the other side, we'll continue our conversation with Kelsey uh, and this wonderful, important conversation about the work that they're doing to be a convener in this region around the conversation of childhood obesity. We'll see you after this. Welcome back to the Ricky Matthews Show from the Citizens Bank Studio. I have my friend Casey Kill, who is the executive director of Let's Go Gulf Coast. It's actually a fund of the Gulf Coast Community Foundation. And I, I, I like to, I, I use that word convener when I was, uh, before we went to break. But that's the thought I had to mind, in mind as you were talking about partnering with all these various organizations at so many different levels around the conversation as it relates to childhood obesity. And the point that you were making about the habits they developed at five, uh, they're going to carry those habits with them the rest of their lives. And habits are hard to break, incidentally. I remember I was in the Mississippi Delta with a friend of mine. His name is Lee Abraham. He's just a, a terrific leader. He's a, he's a country lawyer, but a major league leader in the Mississippi Delta. And we were riding down the road, and we were talking about education in the Delta, and we, we were talking about, I, I think we we're talking about high school or something like that. And he stopped the conversation dead in its tracks. And he said, it's too late. You know, it's too late by the time they're in elementary school. We got to get them in, in early education, very early education, starting with daycare and then pre-kindergarten. That's where we're going to make the difference. And we're not talking enough about that. And whatever you, you give me, by the time, he used to say, by the time they're four. 
it's over. You know, if you don't, if you haven't influenced them by four, you're going to have a hard time turning them around. But, you know, that's true in education, but it's true as it relates to habits that they develop, whether healthy or not habit or not healthy. Not that they can't change at some point in, the, in their future, but the importance of getting to them young is really important. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's hard. We know as adults to break some of those ha- bad habits or any habits, you know, behavior change. There's multiple stages of it. It takes a long time. Um, yeah. And there's research that has shown you know, 40%, about 40% of the kids that are overweight in their childhood, out of that 40% that's overweight in their childhood, they will then go on and approximately 75 to 80% of them will then become obese adults. So that's where you really have that cycle and it's hard to break it. So I was saying, you know, we do work with children in early Head Start programs, early childhood Through middle school and high school, um, we've done some partnerships with local colleges, but also reaching the adults. So through that, we have programming where we work with, we call them our healthy work sites. So local businesses, um, we work a lot with like HR departments, try to do work site wellness campaigns. And then we also work with healthcare providers, a whole wide range of healthcare providers from some of our big hospital systems here on the coast have, you know, backed our programs for the past decade to just local pediatric offices, um, orthopedic offices are big supporters of our work. We do a lot of partnerships with them because a lot of people that come in for orthopedic care, they've noticed, you know, have issues with being overweight and o- obese, and that's causing some of those issues. Um, to dental clinics, you know, it all, it's really so full circle, and there's not really an aspect of the community that you can find that isn't touched in some way or not by obesity, childhood, or adult. So. Hey, listen, uh, this, yeah, this whole notion behind this 5210, is that how you say it, 5210? Yeah, you can say that, or 5210, people say 5210, it's whatever Five, is two, catchy one. Yeah, to you. Yeah. But you know, it's a simple message, it's a powerful message, actually, and it's something, for someone who's listening today, and they want to pull something out of the meeting, just remember 5210, 5210, and let's remind people what that is, because it's it's actually, it's a very simple but powerful message about how they can change uh, their lives if they just commit to this. Yeah, so five or more servings of fruits and vegetables every day, two hours or less of recreational screen time, one hour or more of physical activity, and then zero sugary drinks, trying to drink more water. And then with that, especially working with adults and you know older adolescents and teenagers and things like that, um, everything in small steps is really big on what I preach. So, you know, thinking about five servings of fruits and vegetables, that can either seem so easy to you or it can be so daunting. You know, how can I get five servings of fruits and vegetables in? So we have lots of little easy tips, you know, just like adding one fruit with your breakfast, have a small fruit and veggie snack at lunch. You know, if you have dinner, try to have two veggies on your plate. And then there's a lot of education around serving size. You know, sometimes people think they're a lot larger than they are. There's a lot of misconceptions about that. And then your two hours of recreational screen time, that's important to drive home because as adults, you know, some days I'm on my computer for eight hours. That's my job. Well, that doesn't count. But when you go home, whether to your spouse or by yourself or to your family, you know, try to limit your screen time to two hours or less. And that's especially important for children. You know, I think we all kind of know some of the research there, but trying to get kids to shut the screen time off. We don't want to be a couch potato. Let's get up, use our imagination and do something else, which can lead into your one hour or more physical activity. If you're trying to limit your screen time and you have nothing else to do, well, try to move a little bit, you know, little, like we were saying, baby steps, walking a dog in your neighborhood, you know, bringing your pet out, taking your kids for a little bike ride, calling up a friend and say, hey, let's go, let's walk the Bay Bridge this evening or in the morning. Things that don't have to cost anything, they can be easy to implement, you can be fun and socialize. Um, And then the zero sugary drinks, trying to cut out that soda, like you were saying, and drink more water. And there's obviously a lot that we can talk about that too. Well, Cassie, we'll have you back. I, I really appreciate you joining me today. I've I've enjoyed the conversation. It's uh, it's a little bit of uh, it's important because you you're going to really change kids' lives from a healthy point of view by changing their families. And um, 
there's there's only good that can come from the, a continued focus on childhood obesity. Obesity. So thanks for for joining me today. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. I mean, this is always great to get to talk to you and then to reach listeners as well. And it's a long road ahead of us, but those small, simple, healthy changes, you know, we see in the community. So we just keep doing what we're doing. Have a great day and we will see you tomorrow.